Okay, welcome back. Uh, in this video, we will discuss Chapter 6, uh, the muscular system. All right, as, as you'd imagine, muscles are responsible for all types of body movements. And there are three different types of muscle found in the body. We have skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Now, these three are found in different locations. Uh, there are some similarities between the three, but there are some big differences between the three also. So we'll discuss how they're the same and how they're different. Uh, some basic uh, muscle uh, characteristics. Uh, both the skeletal and smooth muscle cells are elongated. They're basically kind of long uh, and tube-like shaped. Uh, and you can say muscle fiber in place of muscle cell. Those phrases mean the same thing. So I may say muscle fiber or muscle cell, but they're referencing the same structure. And muscles can only do uh, two things. They can uh, shorten, or contract, or relax and go back to normal. They can't do anything else. They get shorter and they go back to its normal uh, normal size. And the contraction and shortening of these muscles is due to the movement of what are called microfilaments. And there are uh, two different types. We'll talk about what those are and why they're different a little bit later on. I will right, we'll talk about uh, the three individual types of muscle uh, tissues here first. Uh, first one we'll go over is cardiac muscle. And like the name implies, cardiac is found in only one place. It's found only in the heart, nowhere else. Uh, the cardiac muscle has what's called a striated appearance or a striped appearance. And we'll discuss why that is here in a few slides. But you have alternating patterns of light and dark bands. So it looks like it's uh, striped, almost like a, a stripe on a tiger. So it goes light, dark, light, dark, all throughout the entire length of the cell fiber. And so some areas look lighter, some areas look darker. And we'll discuss why uh, in a few minutes. Uh, the muscle fibers of the cardiac uh, muscle are going to be branched, kind of like a, the branches on a tree, and have one nucleus per fiber. And they are also under involuntary control. What that means is you don't have any conscious control of making your heart beat. It beats on its own due to a function of the brain and the brain stem. So you don't have to think to make your heart beat among many other operations that your body has. So that's not under your control, it's involuntary. Alright, uh, the branched fibers that are found in cardiac muscle are connected to each other by a structure called a intercalated disc. And this is a structure that's only found in cardiac tissue also. And these discs uh, their biggest function is to help the fibers communicate with each other faster, which exactly is what you what, what you want in a heart tissue. The faster they are able to talk to each other, the sooner they get the heart beating. So this is a very important structure, the intercalated disc. And again, this is a generic image of a heart and where the heart muscle will be in the cardiac tissue. And we'll discuss what these features are in a future chapter. All right, next, we'll talk about uh, smooth muscle. Uh, these fibers are going to be elongated with tapered ends, and the fibers actually will bulge in the middle. So you start off very narrow, then it gets wider in the middle, and tapers back off again. Uh, you'll have a single uh, nucleus located almost dead center of the fiber. as a little bit bigger uh, nucleus than normal. Uh, these are not striated in appearance. These look smooth. So of the three tissue types, or muscle tissue types we'll talk about, this is the only one of the three that is not striated or not striped in appearance. And these are also under involuntary control. You don't have any control over what these do or when they do it. It happens on their own due to a, a structure in the brain. All right, one location that you'll find uh, smooth muscle is in the intestines. This is how uh, material gets moved along throughout the intestines. And if you look at this uh, image here, this would be one smooth muscle fiber. It starts off kind of narrow and bulges in the middle with the larger nucleus and tapers back off again. So all that is one fiber here, that's one fiber here, one fiber here, and the purplish smudge is the nucleus in each one. So that's why it's called a, has a tapered look to it, but it is smooth, there is no striped appearance to it. Are the tissue uh, type that we'll focus mostly on for this chapter will be skeletal muscle. This is the muscle that is attached 
or muscles that are attached to your skeleton. This is how you're able to move. And they're, of course, usually attached to bones, but they can attach to each other also. Uh, the cell fibers are going to be uh, long and tube-shaped. They don't bulge in the middle like smooth muscle does. It's, it's very long and narrow. And also will have many nuclei. Uh, this is like cardiac tissue. These are going to be striated or striped in appearance. And of the three that we've talked about, this is the only one that's under voluntary control. You can choose you know, to pick up a drink or pick up a book or to walk to you know, through a door. You have conscious control over how your skeletal muscles work. Now, assuming there's no injury, assuming there's no, no chronic uh, no disorder or disease, but skeletal muscle is the only one of the three that you can actually control. Right, uh, this slide has a summary of all of the three and the key part, uh, key parts of each one. Uh, like I said, for yeah, skeletal over here, cardiac here, and a smooth here. Uh, for smooth, the spindle shape or the you know, the bulging shape in the middle. Uh, one nuclear fiber, well, uninucleated, one nucleus in each cell fiber. Uh, involuntary for cardiac, striated, branched, uh, also is involuntary. A skeletal, striated, tubular, multiple nucleuses or multiple or multiple nuclei, uh, and is voluntary. So they have some similarities between the three, but there are some big differences. Skeletal is only one of the three that's voluntary, and smooth is only one of the three that is not striated, not striated. All right, next we'll get into skeletal muscle structure. That's why I put the M. Uh, M period is abbreviation for muscle. I just ran out of room on top there. That's why that's uh, abbreviated. Uh, individual skeletal muscles are separated from each other uh, by a layer of a very strong, uh, dense connective tissue called fascia. Now, this fascia can continue beyond that muscle and attach directly to a bone, and that forms a tendon. So that's what a tendon actually is. It is a dense connective tissue that connects muscle directly to bone. There are some, probably some of the more well-known uh, examples of uh, a tendon. Uh, this is the you know, the foot, obviously on the lower legs. The foot. This muscle will be the calf or the gastrocnemius muscle. What attaches that calf muscle to your heel is the Achilles tendon here. And you'll notice on these pictures, uh, tendons are going to be uh, white in color because remember, uh, connective tissue is avascular. It will not have blood vessels, so it won't appear red like a muscle would. That's why they're going to appear kind of a chalky white color. That's also why it's it takes longer to uh, repair this or to rehab from this kind of injury. So an athlete or anyone in general, if you rupture this Achilles tendon or tear it or injure it in any kind of way, it takes longer to heal because there's less of a blood supply to it. That's probably one of the more well-known examples of a tendon. Also on the bottom of the foot, uh, the word plantar is a reference to the bottom of the foot. So there's a, a band of connective tissue that connects the uh, bottom of the heel to where the uh, the balls of the feet are, near the bones at the bottom of your feet. That's called the uh, plantar fascia. So when it becomes infected or irritated, then you have plantar uh, fasciitis or fasciitis. That can be very, very painful to deal with because it's on the bottom of your foot. Anytime you put any kind of weight on it, that causes a great amount of pain. All right. In addition to forming those tendons that are cord-like, a connective tissue can develop into very broad, flat sheets called aponeuroses. Now, these sheets are going to either attach directly to bone or to coverings of other nearby muscles. So this is going to be different from the tendon. Remember, tendon is going to be uh, cord-like. Will be cord-like, and more narrow, like here. But aponeuroses are going to be flat and broad. So here's an example. You have uh, aponeuroses in the palm of your hand. You're covering uh, these muscles here. And also, if you look at the uh, midsection, uh, if you pull away this, the skin, look at the muscle uh, setup of a typical uh, male. This white would be the connective tissue. That would be the uh, aponeuroses here. Remember, the muscles will be red. Uh, connective tissue... Uh, would be uh, in white. 
All right, the typical structure of skeletal muscle is divided up into various layers. And these words tend to be confusing, but if you break it down, it tells you where everything is located. And you'll see this set up again when we talk about uh, nerves, neurons. Uh, the first one, epimysium. Epi means above. So the epimysium is a layer of connective tissue that wraps around the entire skeletal muscles, all the way around. Uh, next one, paramysium. Uh, the muscle is grouped together in small bundles, individual bundles. Those bundles are called fascicles. And the paramysium is what wraps around each of those units, each of those fascicles. And the, the connective tissue found inside those fascicles is the endomysium. So endo means inside. So inside those fascicles, the, ones, the connective tissue that surrounds each individual uh, muscle fiber. So epi means around or above. Uh, peri means around, so around uh, each fascicle. The endo means inside. So if you were to take a, a typical image of this, you know, here you have the bone, then you have the tendon connecting you know, the bone to the muscle. The epimysium is going to wrap all the way around the entire muscle. These individual units, these are the fascicles. So that's one, that's one, that's one, that's one. That's one. And this one is actually pulled out, coming at you, coming out of the picture. That's one fascicle. The tissue that wraps around each of these units would be the paramysium. So what's wrapped around here, and then that border here, and here. And the tissue that's inside these fascicles, like from here to here, that'd be the endomysium. Those are what will wrap around each individual muscle cell or muscle fiber. So don't confuse epimysium with paramysium or endomysium. Alright, well, uh, some basic uh, skeletal muscle functions. Uh, first, uh, of course, to produce movement. This includes all locomotion. Uh, maintain posture. That's how you're able to uh, keep a constant posture, whether if you're you know, laying down or standing up or sitting up. Your muscles help to constantly you know, correct you to give you a, a decent posture. Uh, stabilize joints. This is particularly important for some more ill-fitting joints. Uh, a good example of that is your uh, your upper arm and your shoulder. Your arm is basically just hanging there and kind of bound there by a collection of muscles and tendons and ligaments. It doesn't really s sit there all that strongly. That's why it's fairly easy to you know, dislocate the shoulder. And lastly, the uh, function of the skeletal muscle is to generate heat. Is created by the energy used for contractions. This is why you shiver when you get cold. Your body is shivering to produce more heat. That's what your shivering is for. As you shake due to you being cold, the more the muscle moves, the more heat it generates. Here's a, a image of uh, some of the muscles that we have. There's no way we'd have the time to go over all the muscles. There are over 600 muscles found in the body. And if you notice, a lot of these have a fairly long Latin names so it can get really really in depth with some of these names but we won't go over you know, such a large image all right uh, skeletal muscle microstructure let's see the first one uh, sarcolemma anytime you see the prefix sarco that's a reference to muscle or to flesh and then anytime you see the ending uh, lemma or lemma l-e-m-m-a as a reference to the cell membrane or the plasma membrane. So a sarcolemma is the cell membrane of a muscle fiber or muscle cell. It's just a term that specifically references muscle fibers. Uh, next we have the myofibrils. These are the thread-like filaments that are found within uh, muscle fibers. Uh, they can be either thick or thin. The thick ones are called myosin. The thin ones are called actin. Anyway, I've always kept it straight. Uh, thin then actin, so basically thin without the H. So don't confuse which one's thick, which one's thin, because it usually gets asked on the test. This is why some muscle tissue looks striated. The alternating light and dark bands, they look that way because you have thick and thin filaments side by side. So that thick, thin, thick, thin gives that dark, light, dark, light appearance. Uh, next one, uh, the SR, or the full name is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's a very specialized version of the smooth ER 
fundamental muscle fibers. This is used to store calcium. Calcium is critically important for muscle contraction. If calcium isn't there, your muscles can't contract. And the last term on here are sarcomeres. These are the actual units that cause a muscle cell to contract. And I apologize, the word here got cut off on the end. That should be cell. So the sarcomeres are what actually cause the muscles in general to get shorter as they contract and then go back to normal, all due to the, the, the contraction of sarcomeres. All right, here's one uh, image of a skeletal muscle, kind of cut cross section. These alternating light and dark bands, that's why it looks striated or looks striped. This would be true for skeletal and cardiac muscle. And because of that, it's because you have light and dark bands due to the thick and thin filaments side by side. And this would be one my myofibril pulled out. Sarcolemma here is kind of pulled back here. But remember, that's a reference to the cell membrane of a muscle fiber. All right, skeletal muscle contraction. Uh, this is also known as the uh, sliding filament theory. This can get really, really detailed, but I'll give you a very uh, broad overview of how it works. And I'll also include some uh, links to some videos and some animations on Blackboard so you get a better idea of how it actually works, how it functions. The general overview of how this works is this. The muscle fiber is uh, activated or stimulated by a nerve. And we'll talk about that process, I believe, in the next chapter or two. This causes the myosin heads to attach to a nearby thin filament. This is what's called a cross bridge. You have the thick myosin filament connecting to the thin actin filament. So you're, there's a bridge formed between those two uh, filaments. That's called a cross bridge. Now that myosin head will bind to the next site of the thin filament causing it to pull forward. This is called the power stroke. So the myosin head will connect to the actin filament and then pull forward. And this happens millions of times in each muscle fiber. And this multiplied by millions and millions of times causes the sarcomere to contract. And this is a continuation of what uh, I just mentioned. This happens over and over and over again at fractions of a second, causing muscles to get uh, shorter and that's how you, might, how you have a muscle contraction. Now, of course there's a lot more to it than that but that gets into a lot more uh, biochemistry than I want to get into uh, but it is mentioned in the book and you will get a little more detail in the videos that I'll show you. That's basically how it works. And this key or this last bullet point here is something that's important to remember. A muscle contraction is either going to be all or nothing. It either contracts or it doesn't. There's no middle ground. The lights are on or the lights are off. You're pregnant or you're not pregnant. There's no middle ground. It happens or it doesn't. Same thing here. Muscle contraction is all or nothing. All right, next we'll talk about uh, various forms of body movements. Of course, movement is caused by muscles being attached to uh, bones of the skeleton. Muscles are attached to a bone by at least two points. Uh, one's called the origin. One's called the insertion. The origin is the point of attachment to the bone that doesn't move. And the insertion would be the opposite. The insertion of that muscle is a part of the muscle that attaches to the bone that does move. And here's what I mean by that. An illustration of the arm being flexed. For this muscle here, our brachialis, the origin would be here on the humerus bone, the upper arm. This bone would not move for this movement. The insertion would be here. So whenever you are moving your arm or flexing it in this motion, the only part of the setup that's actually moving is this bone here, the ulna. So for this muscle here, the brachialis, the origin would be here because that bone doesn't move, and the insertion would be here because that bone does move. Every muscle will have its own origin and its own insertion. All right, uh, we'll go over some joint movements. And a lot of these have a, an opposite movement that we'll go over. And I'll show you pictures of all these. You need to be able to recognize these by, not just by definition, but by picture also. Uh, first two, flexion and extension. Uh, flexion, the angle between the bones decrease. So if you are flexing your arm, you are lowering the degree between the, uh, the 
bones of the upper arm, the humerus, and the bones of the forearm. If you extend your arm, you are increasing the angle between those bones. And here's what I mean by that. If you start off in the neutral position here, if you flex your arms this way, the angle between this, these bones here and this bone gets lower. If you extend your arm and sticking it straight out, then you have an increase between the angles of this bone and these bones here. And if you go beyond that straight line, that's when you have hyperextension. So you really don't want to go beyond that that 180 degree mark. Same thing is true for the leg. When you flex your leg or flex your knee, the angle between the femur, the thigh bone, and the bones of the lower leg get smaller because you're getting this closer to this. When you extend your leg, you are increasing the angle. Uh, next two, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Uh, for dorsiflexion, the top of the foot is closer to the shin. And a good way to think about this is uh, standing on one's heels. So, so the top of your foot is closer to your shin. And the opposite of that, where the top of the foot is further away from the shin, if you were standing on your toes, for example, it's called plantar flexion. You are flexing the plantar section of your foot, which is the bottom of your foot. So when the top of the foot is closer to the shin, you're being brought up here, dorsiflexion, or standing on no, this one's heels. If you are getting the top of your foot further away from your shin, uh, the plantar flexion. So if you're standing on someone's toes. You are flexing the bottom part or the plantar section of the foot. Uh, these two terms are almost always confused with each other because they sound very, very similar and they only vary by one letter. You have abduction and adduction. The only difference is B and D. Uh, for abduction, you are moving away from the midline of the body. And for adduction, you're going toward the midline of the body. And the way I've always kept it straight, and this is a horrible analogy to use, but it does work when it comes to the definition. Abduction, if someone is abducted, they're taken away from their home. So abduction, you're moving away from the midline of the body. And again, I'm, I apologize, it's a horrible analogy to think of, but it works for our definition. So abduction, going away from the midline, adduction, going toward. There's an uh, illustration of that. Ab, going away from the midline, ad, going toward. Uh, supination and pronation. Uh, for supination, you're rotating the arm so the palm is facing upward or anteriorly. Like when, when we talked about the anatomical position in Chapter 1, when you're standing up and you're facing forward and your arms are by your side and your palms are up, that is when your palms are supinated. They're facing upward or facing outward. Opposite of that is putting your palms down. That's pronation. If you are in a prone position, you're laying face down. So if your palms are pronated, or in the prone position, they're going to be facing down. So you're your palms up here, supination, the S stands for, being supinated here, and when you put your palm down, pronation. Let's see, and the next three here, eversion and inversion go together. Uh, for eversion, you're turning the, uh, the foot's plantar surface laterally. You're going away from the midline of the body. And the opposite of that would be inversion. You're turning the foot's uh, plantar surface medially or toward the middle. And the best way to keep these two straight, for inversion, you're turning your foot inward. For eversion, you are evading the midline. You're going away from the midline. And last one, uh, circumduction. Uh, you're moving a body part in a circular path. You're going in a circle. So this image has eversion and inversion. This is the person's left foot because they're big toes right there. Inversion, you're turning your foot inward toward the midline of the body. And then eversion, turning the foot outward. You're evading the middle of the body. And circumduction, moving, in this example anyway, she's moving her arm in that circular path. Okay. Alright, that brings us to the end of chapter 6, uh, the muscular system. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me.